Hi, welcome back to December's Sisterhood and Surgery webcast. Today our topic is Pregnancy Challenge for Female Surgeons, the Data Behind Real World Experience, and my co-host, the beautiful Dr. Palma Shaw. Um, if you want to start with introductions. Oh, and before I forget, um, this is a live show, so if you have any questions for the audience, um, please join by web, go to pollev.com, enter DeBakey, and respond with your question, or by text, text DeBakey to 37607, um, and text in your question, and we're gonna um, be happy to answer those. So much, Linda, but great to be here. Um, it's my pleasure to reintroduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth McGee, who was with us a year ago when we talked about infertility. And now we're going to focus on pro pregnancy complications. So it's a really popular topic. So thank you so much for being here. Um, she's the, uh, involved in reproductive endocrinology and infertility and is the vice chair at the University of Vermont Medical Center. She was my classmate in, made in the executive MBA program at the Heller School of Business in Brandeis University. We're very happy to have her here. Um, this is really especially a challenge for female surgeons, given the long hours that we work and the nature of our jobs. And I remember when I was having children, my son is now 17 and my daughter is 14, how concerned I was about whether or not I would have a healthy child um, and I, whether I could give birth safely, given the intensity of my job. And I did have two miscarriages after my first two children. And for my daughter, I was hospitalized for fetal decelerations after a long, busy on-call weekend. But fortunately now I have two healthy children, so it all worked out just fine. So thank you, Lisa, for joining us. Yes, Lisa, you were a hit last time. So, um, and you know, we have three practicing female vascular surgeons with us here today um, to discuss their challenges with pregnancy. And we found these guests actually through the um, part of the solution uh, WhatsApp chat, who has really brought nationally and internationally all the women, you know, women of vascular surgery together. Um, so, welcome. Um, you know, I have my own story, which I've mentioned countless times on on the webcast about um, Ella being born early and um, you know needing multiple surgeries and now she's almost two the years have flown by uh, the days are long right and the years are short is what they say um, so but she's healthy now but yeah I mean pregnancy I mean everybody kept checking my blood pressure because I was so bloated I had my own lymphedema pump in the office um, you know everybody thought I had preeclampsia but anyway it, wor it works it worked itself out. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll move on to the introduction. So Dr. Anita Dura is a, um, here with us today. Hi, we've worked um, together on numerous committees um, and she is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a vascular surgeon at Mass General. She's the director of the vascular lab there, co-director of the PAD Center, associate director of the wound care program and director of the lymphedema center. Um, and despite this, she's still a mom on top of that, which is the most important uh, director uh, role, I would say. Um, and she specializes in advanced endovascular and open techniques uh, with peripheral arterial disease, diabetic limb disease, aortic, carotid, and thoracic outlet syndrome, and venous disease. She completed her vascular surgery fellowship at Stanford her general surgery residency at the Medical College of Wisconsin and medical school in the UK. She's also completed a master's degree in trauma sciences, an MBA in healthcare management, and a certificate in health economics and outcomes research. She's published over 120 peer-reviewed papers and has edited four vascular surgery medical textbooks. And like I said, serves on multiple committees um, through the SVS and other vascular organizations. And um, you're the mother to a four-year-old daughter and a 1.5 year old son congratulations <laughs> thank you so much For, uh, that's definitely the hardest part <laughs> yeah i would i would agree with that i'd like to introduce uh, dr paula Sharman. she holds the dealman chair in surgery endowment and is a tenured professor in the department of surgery division of vascular and endovascular surgery at the in the department of microbiology immunology and molecular genetics at the university of texas health San Antonio. Her clinical activities include performing open and endovascular procedures, wound care, and training residents and medical students. She's a principal investigator on grants from the NIH and the Veterans Health Administration to focus on utilizing informatics tools 
to predict patient outcomes with a goal of use data to tra transform healthcare and influence policy on the federal level. Dr. Sharman received uh, her MD degree at the Indiana University School of Medicine and an MBA from the University of Texas, Austin, as well as an MS degree in clinical investigation from UT Health San Antonio. She has received additional training as a resident in general surgery, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in vascular surgery research at Northwestern University Medical Center. Dr. Sharman is a board, is board certified in vascular surgery, general surgery, clinical informatics, and wound care. She's a distinguished fellow of the Society for Vascular Surgery and a member of the Performance Measures Committee. She has represented the Society for Vascular Surgery on several sub subcommittee work groups, and she is the founding faculty member of the ACGME Fellowship in Clinical Informatics and an invited presenter at the NHLVI 2019 workshop, Predictive Analytics and Implementation Research, charting a research agenda for the 21st century. She serves on the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences Advisory Council and the Cures Acceleration Network Review Board. Dr. Sharman has given numerous presentations at medical and research conferences and published extensively in prominent scientific journals. Welcome, Paula. Thank you for being Thank here with you, us Paula. today. Um, our next guest is Dr. A.V. Bunnell, who attended college at the University of Arizona, which is one of my favorite states, by the way, majored in physiology and graduated magna cum laude. In 2010, she was granted a full tuition scholarship from the uh, Florida Heart Institute to attend medical school at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine. She's developed a passion for the field of vascular surgery and was subsequently recruited into integrative vascular surgery training program at the medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, where she completed her integrative vascular residency. She has been mentored by several key innovators in the field of vascular and endovascular surgery. Um, she's board certified in vascular surgery as well as the RPVI, and she's been awarded many accolades in her career, including the Order of Pegasus University of Central Florida, which is an excellence in academic achievement, professionalism, community service, leadership, research, and publication amongst the entire undergraduate and graduate university population and the Florida Vascular Society Next Generation Scholar that recognizes academic achievement, research merit, and potential in the field of vascular surgery. I said three vascular practicing vascular surgeons, but I also, we have a general surgery resident who is, I'm thinking, going into vascular, right? <laughs> um, and Palm, I'll let you do that introduction. <clears throat> yes, thank you so much, Linda. Yes, it's really my pleasure to introduce our youngest member of the uh, group today, uh, Debbie Lee, who I met on a committee, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, so basically, Debbie is doing research. She is a general surgery resident in her research here at Loyola University Medical Center. Her research is in a fellowship at the Northwestern University. Um, she's researching wellness, and I'll let her uh, talk a little more about that because we're fortunate to have her present a little bit about her current research today, which has to do with surgical outcomes and quality improvement in health disparities in global surgery. She's passionate about improving West resident health and wants to ensure the health, our health and career longevity. She'll be presenting some of this data that we'll get a sneak peek tonight um, that she's going to present uh, at the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery in March of 2022. So we're looking forward to hearing this. And then Lisa will comment about all of these things in her expertise and we'll welcome that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So we'll start with everyone's story since this is um, pregnancy challenges. So I'm sure everybody has their story to tell. So Paula, we'll start with you. If you just want to give us a brief um, synopsis of what you've been through. Thank you very much. It's very uh, honored to be here. And as the oldest person here, there weren't uh, pregnancy uh, protocols or anything when I was a general surgery or a vascular surgery fellow. So I had the perfect plan. I was going to get pregnant in the last half of the last year of my vascular surgery fellowship and then take a year off, have the baby. My husband had insurance. We were all good. And the only problem with that was that I didn't get pregnant. Uh, and had a very long time with working with infertility, ultimately got pregnant with twins after multiple rounds of in vitro uh, fertilization, had done the comet, all of the other things. Uh, and 
Uh, of course, being pregnant uh, with twins, uh, that really limited what I could do. Um, I live in San Antonio and we have a lot of obese patients. So really, I my arms got too short to reach in to do open A or surgery because as my belly got bigger, I couldn't get in to do that. And I had a very wonderful division chief at the time, Max Sykes, who actually had referred me to our fertility specialists here in San Antonio. and. Um, had a couple had miscarriages and all of that but was able to successfully uh carry the twins but of course they were premature uh they came about a month early um, my legs were as big as tree trunks i got preeclamptic i spiked a fever during delivery on uh, all of that they were in the NICU for uh, a couple of weeks although certainly we were very very fortunate with twins they were still both over five pounds and didn't need to be on ventilators. And so of course, bringing twins home and one can't keep his body temperature up and there's two boys, it certainly was a challenge. Um, recommend you can still nurse, breast pumps work really well and now the work environment's a lot more conducive to that. Uh, most of my problems I think were from endometriosis. And so lucky for me, the third child, my daughter Anya came 20 months after the boys and I actually got pregnant by, you know, having sex with my husband. So who knew, who knew that could happen? So, uh, you know, I think it's much, much easier now, but it's always a challenge. Uh, you know, being a female, trying to get pregnant, trying to be a mother and trying to navigate all the complications that can happen with pregnancy with such a demanding work schedule. So thank you so much for having me and um, I will pass it along to the next person. Um, real quick, Lisa, before I forget, just to, I've heard this story so many times of, of um, you know, people having, you know, fertility issues, then having to go through in vitro and then then after that, like have getting naturally pregnant. I mean, is there something about already being pregnant that makes you more fertile? Because Paul is not the first person that's told me that. Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, I think there are things that may enhance follicular development that perhaps are being suppressed that then become unsuppressed. But as far as the data, it's not yeah. really clear that that uh, that can happen. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, the, the numbers of these kinds of things are so small, it's really hard to, I mean, it's not like you can design a randomized controlled trial of pregnancies after pregnancies. And in general, a rapid repeat of pregnancy is not a good thing health-wise. Okay. You know, we like for there to be at least 18 months between deliveries and preferably 24 months between deliveries because the um, um, the side effects both for the, pre, the, the first child and the second child complications are much more likely to happen if there's rapid repeated pregnancy. So that's a that's a big public health issue just to throw that out there. Okay. Uh, so we, we really don't want people to have a baby right after a baby. Except, you know, I mean, there are some times where you have to, to think about the risk benefit analysis and, and what people's age are and, and those kinds of things. But in general, I don't advocate for rapid repeat pregnancy. That sounds miserable. Like just for your, like it took me this long to, to lose the weight. I mean, I don't know. I just, pregnancy wasn't that fun for me. But anyway, um, Paul, I think you're up next with your story. Oh, my story. Well, there's so many stories, but no, I just, I mentioned that my, uh, when I had my the first child on my own and then my second child, I was pregnant and I was, uh, they doubled my call uh, while I was very pregnant. Um, they doubled the call volume and then I had a really bad on call night. And so I ended up um, going in for a regular physical after a really long three day night on call all up, up all night and I had fetal deceleration. So I'll tell you, the first pregnancy, I said, I'm going to work through this. And I was, you know, I never took really any much extra time off. I worked until I delivered. I was actually on call the night I, was, I delivered the first child. And Pedro kept going off and nobody would cover for me. But, um, but the second child, I ended up uh, having the fetal decelerations. And at that point, I said, you know what? I'm taking myself off the call schedule. So I got like a little ticket that says, cannot take call. And... I just did all the elective cases, but I did like E bars, T bars, carotids. I did, didn't, you know, I did all the cases I wanted to do. 
But, um, but it was scary, you know, not knowing why my child was having decelerations. Ultimately, her umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck twice, um, but she's fine, so it's good. And um, Anahita, you're up next. Oh, thank you, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I had the, the opposite uh, situation. So I met my husband when I was a, uh, in a general surgery resident. And um, so there's a little bit of a different take as to what happened um, beyond that. So I was uh, in, in general surgery and my plan had been also a lot like Dr. Sherman's basically to have the baby, the last half, the last <laughs> residency month so that it would be delivered, it, see, it would be delivered, you know, right when I was able to start my fellowship and no one would know. That was my fixation that like, I was gonna go to Stanford. I was at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I waited until they believed I could, you know, I'm, I'm a surgeon now, I'm part of the in crowd in Wisconsin, but I didn't want the Stanford people to know I was trying to get pregnant or was pregnant or anything. And this is my doing, they actually are wonderful. I just had this in my mind that I didn't, they can't know, they don't know me, they're gonna think I'm weak. They're gonna think I need time off. They're gonna think this, they're gonna think that. Anyway. I uh, was also concerned starting at Stanford uh, as a fellow that I'm gonna get a lot of radiation. And so I actually wasn't even married to my, my husband. We purposefully started trying for a baby um, so that I could get pregnant and, and have the baby timely. It did work in that I, was, I got pregnant naturally and then um, uh, got, had, the, had the baby and then had a bunch of interviews for um, my, my uh, fellowship and there was a lot of issues with time off and like maternity leave. So I got three weeks of maternity leave because that's what was left over, so to speak, from the sick time for taking time for interviews. Do you know what I mean? So basically yeah. in order for me to graduate on time, and they left it up to me. No one said, oh, you, you have to do this. It was just, you, you can do whatever you want, but you won't graduate on time if you don't meet this first number of days. So, you know, which is, which is fine. So I, I, I ended up having the baby and then my, um, I thought everything was great. And I planned to have my second child when I was at Stanford again in the last few months of the last. So that is where things went to crap. I thought, oh, I got pregnant the first time. It's gonna be no big deal. None of these issues are gonna affect me. Absolutely not. I couldn't get pregnant. And this before my husband and I were living apart and I got pregnant naturally. But this time we were living together, obviously at Stanford. Didn't work, didn't work. His mom lived in the house with us, so that might be why my <laughs> eggs were free. But I don't know, but whatever. But <laughs> That's like the best were... birth control ever. Is like <laughs> Oh no, definitely. Most definitely. It wasn't him, it was me. I was like, I can't. But we got you know, but everything we did everything timed. And actually I did a lot of naughty things. And by, by naughty things, what I mean is um, I self-prescribed Clomid. I did all this stuff to myself to try to make it happen and it just wouldn't happen. And everything was timed. And obviously I, I'm sure Dr. McGee is gonna say- I know, Lisa, are you like- right? yeah. But I did, you know, and, and I, because I can, right? I did, and I, and I tried it. I did a couple cycles, nothing worked. Thank God I didn't get hyperstimulation or anything. Nothing ended up happening, but I didn't want to stop working. And then ultimately, because I was on Stanford's insurance, I really just had a few months before I was gonna take my new job. And so what I ended up doing is going to the Stanford clinic and we did IUI, which is the um, fertilization essentially where, you know, your husband gives sperm and then they, you, they do all the work for him where they deposit it in you and then you have the baby. So um, I did three cycles of IUI and that sounds like, oh, you know, you just did three cycles. It was impossible. I couldn't make it to the clinic, which was off site. I couldn't take the meds. I couldn't time it. And you know, it's not like you just show up on a day. Like I distinctly remember, like they told us you come on a Saturday because you're going to cycle at that time turned out to be fake news I didn't cycle at that time and so they did the deposit and nothing worked and it's so demoralizing but I couldn't I, I couldn't come even one time to get the ultrasound a couple days before to check are your ovaries ready to go I just couldn't come out of work so I had to go through the cycles just hoping that things were timed appropriately and they allowed me because I was from Stanford and it was the same clinic to just get out of doing the ultrasound which obviously is why it didn't work I couldn't adhere to things appropriately. <laughs> Lisa's and laughing. In, in, well, <laughs> in the end, in the last month, last cycle, last insurance, they told me to come on a Saturday. I couldn't come because I was on call. So I said, let's just bang it out on Friday. And I got pregnant. And so now I have a, a one and a half year old son, well, 18 months now. 
who is everything like IUI, as I was saying before, in that he's super lazy and also can't go from here to here on his own, <laughs> needs mommy to pick him up. So um, he now, um, you know, and luckily he's a healthy baby, but I ended up getting pregnant then and having the baby when I started my first job and as attending at Mass General, where I'm one of the few women obviously in the department and I was so embarrassed about it that I'm pregnant and I've come pregnant and and you know I told my boss and they were wonderful up front and I got so lucky because COVID hit and so I got to have my son on March 14th and so COVID you know COVID lockdown so I didn't have to worry about time off and this and that but even on my bed, as I was induced in delivering, I got a call for a carotid. So even this is still happening today. And I called my, my wonderful partner and took the call while doing it just to make sure everything was in place for that, that case. Um, but uh, ultimately, after my son was born, we named him Vir, V-I-R, so V-I-R for virus, because it was so helpful in me getting maternity leave. <laughs> And so, I mean, we say it as a joke, but I mean, that was because I psychologically was so worried again about being my first year attending and having this issue. But the long and short of it is now I have a four year old daughter and a one and a half year old, well, 18 month year old uh, son. And then I did my husband's vasectomy and my dog's vasectomy the same week. So we are done. <laughs> so, so that is my. Well, I, have to, I have to make one comment as a public health service announcement. Um, Clomid, if you're already ovulating and you take Clomid, it reduces your chance of getting pregnant because of the anti estrogen effects on the uterus. So, and I also say, you know, I don't do my own cardiovascular surgery. So. <laughs> it, <laughs> but, it, but Lisa's like I mean, so they're... disappointed already, and it's like only the beginning <laughs> of the show with all her stories. She's like, ah. <laughs> no, but but seriously, do be careful. I think doctors are some of our worst patients. We because are. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we have our different fields of specialty, and um, sometimes we we don't know quite as much of the details as we think we do. And and people get to feeling so desperate because the timing is so important. Mm -hmm. And and it, it and it happens with with patients that are not physicians as well. Everybody gets this idea about what a perfect family looks like. And they feel such incredible stress to have that family that they make bad decisions in the long run. Not that I mean, the Clomid was probably a bad decision. The other piece is not so much. But um, I just wish that your your fellowship had been flexible enough to let you have the ultrasounds. That was all on me. They were all so, and that's why I want to say that big disclaimer. You know, I think that's part of the problem, though, and that needs to be talked about. The, you know, what we do to ourselves, and I mean, because you have this, you don't really know. Is it really? Are they just saying it like it's virtue signaling, and then as soon as you turn around, they're gonna say, "Oh, you know, let's not take." someone like this anymore who's going to get babies like and you don't want to ruin it for those coming up behind you there's just so much you know and like and what are you going to you're going to take off for the ultrasound you're going to take off for the checks you're going to take off for and actually i forgot to mention one other thing when i was pregnant in my first year at mgh my 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 gynecologist or sorry my ob gyn actually made a joke that i was like one of her like delinquent patients because i couldn't make it to any ultrasounds i keep canceling canceling so i think i did like just the heart one and like just one more before delivery and that's why she induced me because she couldn't she just you know want needed a time and had to get me in there so that was also problematic but that goes to what we were talking about before with this idea that as you get pregnant if you have to go through these hurdles it's real easy to just say oh we you know this, these are the things you can do but until the system is set up to not make us do all the you know i don't need to build the house and cut the tree and bring the lumber like you know and then even when I went off for maternity leave, which I know we're not talking about today, I had, was a new attending. I had just built up an okay practice. I would have come back to dust, right, if I had just taken off. So you need something where who's going to take those patients? How is it going to come back to me? The same way as if I broke my leg, you know, how would, how would I have a, a system to come back to? And I think that one, we, that's what we, we should work together as women to design a system where it's not punitive. And Even I would throw that out there that the men that are becoming fathers should have some of the same time to be with their mm -hmm. newborn and, and to build their families because yeah. they don't go through the physical act of giving birth, but they become a new parent and they also should have time to be with, with their child, the beginning yes. of this new family. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it will not be equal until that's the case. And, and unfortunately, you know, it's, be, you're, I mean, Lisa, the whole reason is behind a physical 
setback, right? I mean, we get that time off because we went through a vaginal delivery or a C-section for our bodies to recover. And so therefore we get it, but they don't. But I mean, it really should be about just being with your baby, whether you're a mother or father and getting to spend that time because just like how we miss out on, because I felt the same, like, well, I had my baby a couple years in a practice, but when I came back, it was really hard for me to get back into all my, you know, consultants, you know, they, they were used to be me, me being gone for so long. And so they were, you know, calling my other partners. I mean, to get all that back, I felt really, um, you know, it just wasn't a, a, a good feeling like, oh, like all this work and now I'm, I'm kind of starting over. Um, and so, you know, but the man at the same time, you think of it from their side, they miss out on like all the months that, you know, we get to be um, with the baby. So, um, but oh, it's already 5.30. Okay, Avi, let's let's hear your story. <laughs> we're, this is why I was like, we're not gonna have um, nothing to talk about. That's for sure. <laughs> Um, well, I'm just really pleased to be here and hear everything you guys have gone through. It's, it's really inspiring to me. Um, I think I, I can relate to a lot of what you all are saying. I think also kind of the nature of what we do, um, it, it reflects on our personalities in general. And um, for me, I recognize a lot through this process my need for uh, controlling things in my life and planning things out and then realizing that that's been possible essentially. Um, I, uh, I, I got married um, 10 years before we started trying for children because I wanted to make sure I finished all of my training um, before, you know, expanding my family and didn't want it to affect my work too much. So after I finished my training, I uh, started trying with my husband, um, you know, did uh, just routine, um, you know, ovulation testing and things like that for several months. We finally got pregnant with our daughter and the first half of the pregnancy went very smooth other than the typical, you know, sickness and, you know, usual stuff. Um, when I was in the very end of the second trimester, I noticed a lump on my right breast and I brought it to the attention of my uh, gynecologist and uh, both her and I assumed that this was just pregnancy related breast changes. Uh, got an ultrasound just to make sure, well, that was suspicious, so got a biopsy and guess what, you got bre breast cancer. Um, so then we were initiating discussions about how do we manage this? What do we do? What's the time frame? Um, do we need to have the baby a little bit early so the treatment can start? Uh, and uh, that that was all, you know, the very end of, of April. Well, about three weeks later, um, my blood pressure started rising and rising and rising. And I went into preeclampsia, uh, unbeknownst to myself. I was just in to see my OBs for serial uh, tests and blood work and urine and um, decided not to wait to speak with the OB after uh, my testing because that's a waste of time and I had surgeries to do. So <laughs> I went off to the OR and was operating all morning. I did uh, two EVARs, a carotid, I was about to leave to go to the office and do some veins and looked at my phone. I had 10 missed uh, calls and several voice messages from both my uh, OB and the maternal and medicine doctor saying that I need to get to the hospital. Um, so I decided to, you know, drive myself. I called my husband, told him, don't worry about coming. I'll let you know if you need to come by. They probably just want me to like hang out on bed rest for 24 hours or something. Um, so by the time I got there, he showed up too, cause he didn't listen to me. Thank goodness. And, uh, I, my, uh, liver enzymes were through the roof. My platelet count was 30. I was in full blown health syndrome. And they said, you're having the baby right now. So 30 minutes later, uh, we had my child, um, under, well, it was general anesthesia, but they didn't start it until um, just after the cesarean started because I, I couldn't have a spinal block uh, because my platelet count was so low and they didn't want to give the GA too soon to affect the baby. So I'm sitting in the OR, looking up at the OB doctor with her scalpel, starting to cut on my belly, and then I blacked out. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I woke up about uh, about a half a day later uh, in the ICU because apparently I hemorrhaged, lost about three liters of blood, and they had to put a balloon um, into my uterus to tamponade for the bleeding, uh, kind of like Reboa, but for the uterus, which I didn't realize that was a thing. Um, and <laughs> that remained in place for another 24 hours before they were able to slowly um, remove it, which was excruciating. Um, so now we're almost two days after my child was born, and then I finally got wheeled over to the NICU to meet her. Um, she was ventilated, you know, she was premature by just over two months. Um, so she needed a little bit of support. Um, 
thankfully we both were able to make it out of the hospital within a few weeks and she's been healthy since then. So then in the, and as soon as I got home, my journey through the breast cancer treatment began. Um, within four weeks of my cesarean, I had to have my mastectomies. Um, and then that left four weeks from the mastectomies to starting chemo. And guess what? That was my window to try to preserve any fertility I could get. So I got to go through one cycle of um, harvesting uh, of my eggs and um, I, I took, you know, hormones and everything throughout that time um, to do so. I got through one cycle. I was able to get 22 eggs out, which was awesome. Wow. Well, 22 eggs led to just three embryos that fertilized and were uh, healthy and, you know, normal DNA count. So we froze those three and, you know, fingers crossed for a possible future. We don't know yet. But then I spent the next six months after that going through chemo and breast reconstruction surgeries and everything else. Um, I finally stopped all treatment uh, in January of this past of this year, and uh, now we're kind of you know in recovery mode, uh, getting healthier and stronger. My daughter's thriving; she's amazing, um, and we are now starting discussions with several fertility specialists about how safe it is to pursue another pregnancy with the uh, embryo we've harvested, um, or if. I'm able even to um, host a pregnancy myself, or a lot of unanswered questions right now uh, with regards to that. Um, but like I said, you know, it's been a really humbling experience. I've learned a lot about not uh, banking on my ability to plan everything out and control everything because it's just life happens. Um, and I really do appreciate this session because I feel like this is this is something that I would have benefited from. Um, going through training and everything earlier too. Like I, I would have really appreciated uh, people stepping up and, and being vocal about this kind of stuff early on. Well, I mean, Avery, I hope you, that made you realize how strong you were or are, I should say, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, mean uh, you know, it's kind of one foot, one foot after the other. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think so, and, and my daughter is very strong, and I think you know we're we're learning a lot of life lessons through it, and uh, and we're just grateful to be here. <laughs> wow, well, what a story of triumph that is, um, Lisa. Do you have any comments about um, what Avi went through and breast cancer? All I have to say is wow, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in awe of you. Um, wow. Um, as far as breast cancer, there it, it, it's fairly complicated. I'm glad you're talking to some specialists because there's lots of different variables about safety and when to do what and, and those kinds of things. And then, but there's also, um, you know, depending on how much treatment you had and, and what kind, um, the reduction in fertility potential is not 100% even if you've had chemotherapy. So there's a lot of variables there. I've had patients that have done fertility preservation and then actually had babies naturally later on. Um, and then I would just say, you know, also make sure you talk with your cancer docs and what kind of tumor you had and, you know, what kind of uh, receptors and all of those kinds of things, because that can also have a bearing on, you know, the, the cancer docs used to always say, oh, you need five years just so we know. And it's like, but why? And, you know, they couldn't really answer that. So, um, you know, and, I, and when I started the first cancer um uh, the first center for, for reproduction for cancer survivors many years ago, it, it wasn't the first in the country, but it was one of the first. I went to um, some of the, the leaders of the cancer center and I tried to talk with them about that and to, to try to collaborate. And what they told me was our patients don't want to be pregnant. They're just grateful to be alive. <laughs> and you know, that is so not true. Even then it was not true. So, you know, I, I just encourage everybody to be advocates for themselves and not take the first answers they get and use all of those um, lovely intellectual properties that you have that made you a vas vascular surgeon and use that to explore other fields and find out what the right answer is for you and, and find people that will be your allies and your teammates in that pursuit and, and not your, 
you know, dictators of what should happen because it, it, there's so many variables and there's no one pathway to parenthood. I think you're so right. And to be honest, you know, no one imagines themselves getting a diagnosis like that in reality, but certainly not um, kind of earlier in their life. I mean, I'm, I'm only 33 now, so I was 31, 32 when, when this happened. So um, imagining, you know, your future of having children, mm -hmm. whatever size family that you were anticipating, that, that completely derails that. And, you know, just being grateful to be alive after cancer is very, it's wonderful, it's a good thing, but it's not the only thing in your life to focus on. There are other goals to still achieve, and, and those goals don't just go away um, after that treatment. So I, I completely relate to what you said. I'd like to have Debbie um, comment, um, and maybe Debbie, give your perspective on hearing all of this. I mean, as a trainee and, you know, maybe a future young mother, um, how you feel about this, and, uh, and then a little bit about the data that you've derived from your uh, surveys that you're going to be presenting. We'd love to hear it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor to be surrounded by such strong and accomplished women here. And leaders who are going to advocate for trainees like me as I am just navigating my first pregnancy. And I can tell you, I'm super excited because I can feel the baby kicking me constantly throughout mm -hmm. this entire conversation. <laughs> but um, is that exactly what like Dr. Doa said? I think there are a lot of self-imposed stigma on trainees, on surgeons, on female surgeons, especially um, as we are navigating pregnancy that we have to deal with uh, because we have to come to work. And even though I'm currently on research, I still waited until I was five months before I told anyone because I felt uncomfortable. I felt that I don't know if my program will look at me differently, which they haven't. They have been extremely supportive. Everyone that I have told have been so supportive of this journey for me. But I, after hearing some of your stories, I definitely feel lucky that I'm in my position right now and I have strong advocates for trainees like me. And I'm gonna actually share my screen to share some of the things that we have found in our study. Can everyone see okay? Perfect. Yeah. So part of my research at uh, Northwestern is looking at the obstetric experience of surgery trainees. And what we did is we used the national survey of um, AbSite and VSite data uh, that was done last year to evaluate residents and trainees experience with their obstetric journey. We looked into the complications, the stigmas, and the association with wellness, such as burnout, thoughts of attrition, and suicidal thoughts. What we found was that there were quite a bit of gender disparities that, fem that more female residents and trainees have experienced. That, that included delaying having children, or even being advised against having children during training, and that there were higher obstetric complication risk that were experienced by female trainees. And these included things like miscarriage, placental abruption, preterm labor, as well as, um, uh, as, well as intrauterine growth restriction, unexpected C-section, or like even postpartum depression. And what this data told us was that there were increased risk for these trainees that experienced these kind of, uh, these experiences had more burnout as well as thoughts of attrition. And a different study that I have done by our group is that what can we do to help these trainees? And some of the things were already talked about is mentorship and as well as role models. I think having that role model within your in institution to normalize your pregnancy and parenthood during training is crucial because without that, we really don't know where to look for support. We can't just ask another pregnant, pregnant mo mother or another pregnant person, oh, so how should I do this while going through surgical training? 
And that program support is also very important, having a supportive program director or associate program director and a supportive chair that's willing to you know, make the effort to really change the culture of the program is actually really important. And then well, another thing that we discovered was actually lactation support. Being able to have a place where you feel safe and comfortable to pump because a lot of the trainees will have to go back to residency or go back to fellowship uh, just a few weeks after giving birth and that they would like to continue um, to provide their own breast milk to their baby. I think that is very important. And I think one of the last things that um, would be really supportive is having that gender equality, you know, supporting male colleagues, male trainees to also take paternity leave so that there is equality between both genders so that we can support the trainees all together as a whole. Now I'm gonna stop this. So I'd like to jump in just as a program director myself for a fellowship program and, and the ACGME demands, requires that there be um, lactation rooms in close location to every resident and fellow um, training location. And they also, that's, that is private and quiet and has a refrigerator. So, um, you know, you, you're not asking for anything that's outside of the realm of normal and it's actually required by every credential training program in the country. So if you're not getting a place to, to pump and to store your milk, then um, your programs are um, in, in deficit and they could actually get a warning for that. Not that I'm asking anybody to, to turn their programs in, but it's, it gives you a point of power to have that conversation with your program directors. Absolutely. Um, we do, Debbie, that was um, a great data that you shared. Thank you. Um, and again, mm -hmm. congratulations. Um, it's going to be an exciting, you know, it doesn't end. It just keeps going and you just keep getting more tired, but that's all right. Um, yes. So we do have a question from the audience. Um, what was more challenging being pregnant on the job or going back after maternity leave? Anybody want to go I can go start first? with that one. Yeah, um, I'm still I, thinking I, about I, my answer actually. hundred <laughs> percent, no question at all going back. Going back, going back every time, not, for me the going back wasn't too long uh, in both cases, but what it, you know, what it is, is that now on top of everything else, you have extreme guilt because you've got your kid at home yeah. and you're like, I went through all this to have a baby, to abandon them at home and come to work. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're at, at least in the beginning, you know, things are, your perception of things changes a lot. Like things that were super important before were, are not anymore. And for the first time, some of the personality characteristics that you might even, for example, for me, that I hold very dear and, you know, that's a part of, oh, that it's Dua, you know, if you need something done, she'll get it done. And like, I'm there till two, and like, those are, those are things I, I pride myself in and I, you know, built my resume around and this and that. And now suddenly I have a case that my partner could, is supposed to cover if they're on call but I don't want to show I'm not weak, but like that I, I'm going home to my, my, my son. And so that you have to play that whole game in your head and no one said anything. Everyone's like, you should go home to your child. Um, and then there is also the other thing, which is kind of, this is going to sound awkward, but the other extreme, like nowadays, you know, we do talk about these things like pregnancy. We do talk about these things like going back to work. And so, you know, but you also have to remember that women are different. Like we're not all one pot that are all the same. And so, so I've had situations where mentors with all the right intentions have said things like, you really should not be working on that grant. You really should go home to your children. You know, don't miss these years. Don't miss. And like, no, I have to work on this grant. I want to work on this grant. You know, I, I, I'm not mm -hmm. going to go home and build macaroni houses with my child. That's really not me. I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so I think recognizing that different women are in different places and what that woman needs and, and kind of navigating all that was very hard coming back. Mm -hmm. So I think. Those are things I didn't even think about before mm -hmm. uh, getting pregnant. Yeah, you're right about that. I mean, you know, some women are, you know, we're all different, right? Um, but it's it's funny how 
uh, you know, people just assume, well, well, you need to go home to your kids. You know, you, you need to go, like, you can't be staying, you know, I mean, and what if, I mean, I'm the type of person that, like, yes, I want to go home, you know, but not everybody's like that, right? And so you can't assume that every woman that's a mom wants to leave early, you know, wants to, uh, doesn't want to do extra. I mean, sometimes it's it's almost like you're, um, you kind of get a break at work, as, you know, like you get to talk to, uh, you know, adult people. And <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a different environment. So, mm-hmm. Anybody else have an opinion on that? Which one I they thought was harder? I think I was surprised at how hard it was to go back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, career driven woman grants and everything else. And all of a sudden I wasn't, you know, and it never dawned on me that I'd be like, wow, <laughs> you know, these two <laughs> little babies are mine. And for my daughter too. And I actually took more time with my daughter than I did with my twin sons because that time is very precious. Um, and I, and I hear what you're saying. Um, I had a lot of grants while I, you know, I had a KOA. I saw, you know, my joke is, is that I had two babies and got one grant and then I had one baby and got two grants. And then I hoped I could keep getting grants without being pregnant, you know, um, which did work. Uh, but then you get this whole thing about when you pull back. And for me, it was for research, not for motherhood. I had an anesthesiologist say, oh, well, you had children. So, of course, you're not doing as much clinical work. And I'm like, no, it's because I have grants, not because I have babies. So I wouldn't have pictures of my family in my office because I didn't want to be seen as a mother at work because that would limit my career opportunities and everything else. Uh, I think that's better now. Uh, and now in every presentation, I have a picture of my family or a picture of kids, just so that women who are coming up in the ranks can know that yes, you and medical students, you can be a mother, you can be a surgeon, you can be a researcher. I don't pretend to have any balance in my life. There is none of that, but at least you can have. And, and do it all and just certain things become more important at different parts and you know this constant cycle and so like I just said you're gonna be tired but you know it's it's definitely worth it my boys are in college and my daughter just graduated from high school so you know it all works out and now you're working hard because you got to pay for the college <laughs> <laughs> all those three kids yeah <laughs> I also think coming back was harder. Uh, I mean, I I didn't slow down for a minute when I was pregnant. I was working and operating up until I had my baby. Um, when I came back, I, I think, um, well, I came back after, let's see, I, it was technically, I was gone for two months. In the first month I had surgery. Well, well, the first month I was recovering from a cesarean, then I had another surgery. And then I decided to come back because I can't take, I can't take that much time off from work, right? Um, you know, a lot of it was that pressuring myself to uh, to make sure I was continuing to perform and didn't want to let down my colleagues um, who, you know, they, they rely on me for certain things. And uh, not that any of that was pushed from their perspective. They were always very supportive of me um, taking as much time as I needed and um, saying that we'll work out the rest of the details when you get back. Um, so that wasn't quite it. The other challenging part, other than my own pressure about it, was the financial aspects of being gone and coming back, which was very challenging for me. I'm in private practice. Um, uh, I'm in a, a, a situation where you know production plays a large role in how I sustain my business. Um, and taking two months off, uh, it has a very large financial impact. Um, and it takes a long time to build back up from that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that I learned, you know, throughout the last year of rebuilding. Um, luckily, I had a lot of support and um, and things are, are going great. But it was just that was very surprising to me. I never heard much about it because all of the people I talked to about it were men who took about two weeks away from work and then just came back. So essentially, it was like they took a long vacation. You know, they took two weeks instead of one. That's not the same thing as being gone for two months. 
Um, and so that that was a very big part of um, the comeback being more challenging and feeling like I have had to overwork myself to kind of fast track back to where I was uh, before and exceed it. Um, but you know, part of that was my own pressure. Wow. The other issue is the childcare, of course, right? You know, oh, now yeah. who's mm-hmm. going to care of that baby? I mean, I had my. I told you about the mother-in-law, but at, you know, my mom took my child for six months of the, from the, so baby was born. I did three weeks and then I left. I went to, I, I, I left for a fellowship. I moved to California. She kept the baby in Wisconsin for that whole time. And then finally brought my daughter when she was six months old. And then we all came you know, together, husband, his mom, <laughs> baby. And then with my son, um, my mother-in-law was living with me which I'd rather just leave the baby alone in the house. <laughs> but, you know, that <laughs> helped, of course, for a little bit. But the um, but then, you know, she went back. She's visiting back and forth to India. And so now we have someone who's actually still here right now upstairs, you know, helping and but can't live without that person. So then you have that whole other thing. Talk about control. You know, the school just decides to have a work development day and now your kids are home suddenly and you not no plans for this. And, and that is really difficult, too. You go to your partners and say what? I have to go home because my daughter's out from school. And, you know, that added a whole nother element of guilt that, again, harder to come back than have the pregnancy. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Um, I hope your mother-in-law is not watching, by the way. Um, and, so, Lisa, um, any, you know, we, we love to hear from you. I mean, all the advice you gave us in the last, um, the last webcast about pregnancy. Um, do you have any last-minute comments um, about just, you know, public service announcements, anything. So I'll say again, where you led, where you led, where you led. (laughs) Um, But um, the other piece is that, you know, we have a really hard time as physicians. I I had my daughter actually at Stanford and and she was at the Stanford daycare. Uh, I was in a research fellowship at the time and not practicing clinically. So it made it a little easier. But when I look at complication rates and things like that with preterm delivery and preeclampsia and all of that kind of stuff, um, uh, surgeons and and female physicians in general are not that different from another uh, uh, professional group, hairdressers. So um, cosmetologists also work on their feet all day. They're, they've got their hands in front of them. They're, they're dealing with chemicals and all of those kinds of things. And they have a higher rate of pregnancy complications as well because of their exposures and also because of being on their feet all the time. So, so I like to throw that out there to folks every once in a while to help them feel a little more normalized that um, it's not just a surgeon thing. It is a woman, you know, a woman that has to work to support her family, kind of thing, and the pressures that we face um, are really, are really heavy duty. But at least what we do in general now, trainees do have, um, you know, a lot of financial constraints and, and loans to pay back and everything. But at least we have the opportunity to have a nanny or to have some of these things that that let us. Um, that support us to do our, our really difficult job. And, and I've always been really grateful for that. I happen to be extremely grateful because I had a husband that was willing to stay home when my daughter developed some, some issues and needed a parent at home. And so I've had a career because my husband was, was very gracious and, and, and caring. Um, that's something else that comes up. Um, the NIH data and the National Academy of Science did some studies about women in academic medicine and who was successful. And the single variable that they came up with about who is successful is who you marry. Now, whether that's a man or a woman or, or, or someone that doesn't, uh, you know, isn't binary, uh, but having a life partner that's supportive and helpful uh, is, is critical. And, and so I think that's, that was really interesting to me. Uh, and when I think about people that I know that are leaders in academic medicine across fields, uh, that are women, many of them had a stay at home husband or had, um, a mother-in-law or a mother that was able to be there and help with all of that. Um, but even if you don't have that, there are ways to make it work. And, Something that somebody told me a long, long time ago before I had children is there's no good time to have a kid. 
You know, mm-hmm. we always think about the perfect time. You wanted to time it right at the end of the fellowship, you right at the end of the residency or in between at these perfect times. And most people can't have a child right when they want to, especially after we get above the age of 30 or so. Um, there is something called secondary infertility. Having the second kid is always harder than having the first one. Um, and, and so, you know, thinking about things like that and nothing is perfect. Um, all women are different. Um, miscarriages are incredibly common. Pregnancy complications are incredibly common. Um, there's still a lot of, of racial and, and socioeconomic disparities in medicine as far as pregnancy outcomes. And, and we need to be thoughtful about that as well. Um, but I, I think you guys are part of the future and, and creating a culture where things can be different, where we can put families first whether you're a father or mother or a non-binary parent, um, we all love our children and, and we all have needs to balance work and life. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Palma, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I would say um, I really appreciate everybody's uh, honesty um, you know, 17 or even 18 years ago when I desperately wanted to have children and I had my first child at age 37 and my second at age 40. So, and I was lucky to have these two beautiful children and I have pretty much raised them on my own with the help of many other people like my mother. And I really never had any other individual that was there for me. And there are many times it was difficult, but there's never one moment that I ever thought it wasn't worth it. And it's, it's really hard, but, and I would tell every woman watching this, you know what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And having those beautiful children is so much better than not having those children. And I would not let anything, any job, career, person, uh, need for in vitro, whatever it may be, I would never let that stand in the way of having my own child, if that were possible. Mm-hmm. So I just want to thank everybody for everything you've said. And I hope that this webinar is helpful to the younger women that are now, you know, looking at this, and I'm sure there are many watching my own residents, uh, watching this, and I hope we can give them courage and strength um, because they'll have their own challenges. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Here's what I found. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.